In the last several months, many industries have seen an increase in resignations as a result of the significant shift in the job market. What can employers do to combat the great resignation? On today's episode, we'll be discussing what factors have shaped our current hiring landscape and what's the best way for organizations to attract and retain the best talent. To help drive this discussion and provide insights, I'd like to welcome Tina Rogers, Director of Talent and Acquisition here at Husky, and Megan Diamond, Director of Human Resources at Canadian Premier Life Insurance Company. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tracy. It's great to be here. As we kick off 2022, we're continuing to see the job market evolve into what people are calling a candidate's market. So let's dive in with some questions and talk about this issue. How would you define the current manufacturing hiring landscape? Megan, we'll start with you. Well, Tracy, I would say that in manufacturing, it's similar to other industries in that it's quite a challenging market right now, even fickle, some might say. So whether we call it the great resignation, the big quit, the tsunami turnover, we do know that attrition is high across the world right now in every industry. Um, Some Industries and sectors are impacted more than others. Some geographies are impacted more than others. And manufacturing actually has been um, really influenced by this, um, like retail and hospitality, more than other sectors right now. So it's challenging. uh, It's ambiguous. But at the same time, it's also full of potential. What about you, Tina? I agree with Megan. Uh, We have seen a lot of... um, Uh, a lot of challenges in all areas of the business, not just in our manufacturing area, but specifically in manufacturing with COVID, um, it brought exceptional challenges to us uh, around the fact that people still need to be in the office in a nice, safe environment. Um, And that's been a real challenge. Um, The other thing that we we are seeing is that it really is a candidate market and um, candidates are really... uh, um, able to ask for the world and uh, hope to get it. And it's something that we are uh, we are faced with right now at looking at those challenges and figuring out how to um, combat them in the right way. What factors contribute to and shape the current landscape? And what do you think are some industry-specific factors and challenges? From my point of view or from, from what I'm seeing out there and what I'm hearing, you know, that different consulting firms are are sharing with us uh, is the fact that, well, first of all, we have an aging population. Um, We, we have uh, people with different, different ideals of what, what it's like to, to go to work, what it's like to be at work, what it's like to get from work. Um, And the landscape is changing. And uh, so organizations need to change as well to ensure that we are uh, keeping up with what is competitive in the market. Uh, the other thing I think in a sp- specifically in the uh, manufacturing area is um, the skilled trades have uh, fallen off. And with the young people um, coming out of school, uh, high school, colleges, or wherever it may be, um, they're not choosing the skilled trades nearly as much. It, it hasn't been... Um, it hasn't been seen as as appealing uh, of a job to to take on and or a challenge for them to to learn and grow into the uh, skilled trades. So we are finding that it's more and more difficult to find young people that want to come in and grow in our organization. Those are some interesting trends that seem to be emerging. So what percentage of the workforce needs to be replaced, in your opinion, generally speaking, and and how do you see that uh, relevant to Husky? I would say if only we had a, a crystal ball, that would be helpful, right? It's a very hard um, thing to forecast. I don't know that anyone or any even consulting organization can answer that question with certainty. Um, but we do know, as Tina mentioned, with the aging workforce, if we look at our baby boomer population as an example, by 2030, all baby boomers will be of age 65. And we have traditionally used that as our measure as a retirement uh, prediction. Now, we know people are working longer than ever before, and that's when I uh, mentioned it's not as easy to, to forecast. 
Um, looking at numbers globally, uh, again, it's not uh, an easy measure, but we do know in looking at the U.S. alone that 25% of today's workforce are baby boomers who are likely to consider retirement uh, in the next few years. Canada's population is aging more quickly than others. There's plenty of white papers out there to confirm that. Um, but less about broader global stats, I think many organizations are looking at their own internal population. Um, so measuring their own demographics to say, okay, what retirements are imminent and likely in the next few years and really creating strategic workforce plans to make sure they retain that knowledge and, and transfer it um, from generation to generation. Thanks, Megan. So talk to us about the current talent shortage uh, and how that's impacting the manufacturing industry. Well, it, uh, Megan really said it well at the very beginning. It really is dependent on uh, the region. Uh, it's very different globally, depending on where uh, where plants are located, uh, what the types of uh, uh, problems that are being seen. However, I would say that uh, the U.S. has been very, very, a very hard market uh, for the last, I would say, two years, maybe even longer. Um, but we are seeing Canada uh, start to become equally as tough. And uh, reading a lot of uh, white papers, to Megan's point, um, and, and uh, um, it, it, it is true that Canada hasn't seen as much of the, of the great resignation as everybody's hearing. However, we are faced with a talent shortage uh, in, in our Canadian location, Husky itself. Um, and we are seeing some of the trends that we, we uh, saw in our American um, plants are now c coming here to, to Canada. Uh, in Europe, we're, we're seeing different, different things altogether. Um, in our Luxembourg location, for example, um, we're, still, we're still able to find good, good uh, uh, trades uh, folks uh, in our manufacturing area. Um, some of our engineering roles tend to be a little bit harder in Luxembourg area. Um, but for the most part, it, it hasn't it hasn't caught up to where Canada and the U.S. are at the moment. Interesting. So, how do the preferences of top talent candidates differ from candidates of previous generations? For example, Megan. Yeah, what well, I would say you can have top top talent across every generation, right? So when young people coming in, they can be the best and the brightest of their university classmates and such. Um, you know, some young engineers have patents pending at a very early age. But I do think when you look at generations and their preferences, um, they're different and they're unique. So if we look at uh, baby boomers, um, more generally speaking, of course, we know that um, it's a generation that prefers organizational structure and um, more apprehensive where change is concerned. And if we look at the younger generation in the workplace right now being Gen Z, they are very agile, love change, almost count on it and, and consider it something that's, that's normal. So that plays a role because um, I think gone are the days when employees stay with one employer for their entire career. I think that will be more and more unlikely uh, with new generations coming in and Gen Z and, uh, and those that follow, likely you know, three, five, 10 years with an organization will be great tenure. And Tina, how do you see this in terms of, uh, you know, talent attraction at Husky? I think if you look at, uh, you know, to Megan's point, gone are the days where, for example, uh, you know, I would say retirement packages are people's primary motivation, for example, when looking at a compensation uh, package or, or total compensation. What are you seeing today in terms of these uh, candidates? First of all, to build off the demographics conversation, uh, Husky has a history of long tenured employees. So um, that, that our, the foundation of our talent management and our uh, talent retention and attraction programs have been built around um, retaining team members long into the future. So we have some really phenomenal programs for that reason. Um, but to build off of what new people, uh, the younger uh, generation, what they're wanting uh, is, is more around 
um, what, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? Where, where am I going? What is my growth? What can you do for me? How can you develop me? Uh, it's not just about getting a big paycheck. It, it's about where can I go and how can I expand my knowledge? Um, how can I learn from what the organization is going to give to me? So I think uh, as we as we look at this and as we move forward, it's going to be very important that we consider our value propositions and ensure that we're not just looking at it from the lens of either where we have come from and or our past lens, but we're also looking at what the future lens brings and what is important to to uh, to that age group. I think it's a great point. And when you look at the um, newer generation in Gen Z, they are very much focused on development and learning and career pathways within an organization, but also around purpose, social impact. What are they connected to? How do they contribute to the organization's mission, vision, values? Those things are very important to new generations coming in. And something I think that Husky can really um connect with, you know, newer talent on. That's a very good point. And our, our sustainability and, and environmental uh, um, uh, awareness and, and uh, driving that, we need to harness that and, uh, um, and that and, and, and our customers and vendors that we work with. There's so much potential there for us to harness that and, and other organizations in the world looking at that social purpose and responsibility is a really good point. So you mentioned the long tenured uh, base of employees, Tina, when talking about Husky. So I guess, you know, we're a great example of a company that successfully attracted, hired and retained, uh, I would say, skilled workers. So if you fast forward to today, um, you know, in terms of benefits or perks, what are top talent really looking for these days? Yeah, it, it, uh, flexibility in their choices. Um, a traditional benefits plan, um, which wears it's awesome and that it gives us, uh, gives us what we think we need new employees, the younger generation are looking for the ability to say, well, I may not need this, but I may choose something else. Is that available to me? What kind of choices do I have? That's one thing. Um, also you mentioned Tracy, uh, about retirements, retirement savings, pension plans, um, whereas uh, uh, we as an organization have a wonderful plan that will set people up very well for retirement. Um, however, the younger younger folks coming into an organization are, are perhaps looking at, at, at something different. Um, they have student loans. They, uh, they want to buy a house. And, and on many of the markets, actually, not just... Uh, not just in Canada, but many of the markets that our plants are located and where we hire people uh, are not the, not the, the easiest place to, to purchase a home or uh, to move forward in that way. So we do need to be creative and uh, rethink um, what else we can offer, what kind of value proposition we can give from, from a benefit standpoint. But I think flexibility is really important. And the other thing too, I think is recognizing diversity, diversity in the family structure, diversity in how their family is, is formulated. Um, it, it's not always a, a, a mom, a dad and kids, like there are different family units, um, and that we need to be aware of that and conscious of that. So ensuring that our benefits will, um, meet those needs as well. So one other point that I would make on that um, is well-being, right? A focus on wellness and well-being overall. Um, and many organizations are starting to implement wellness programs in some capacity. I think that Husky uh, and Husky's employees are very fortunate to have wellness centers on site where you have access to, um, you know, gyms and uh, physiotherapy, naturopathy, whatever the case might be, but recognizing those uh, supports, both physical and mental health, are really important at the moment as well. And, and Megan, if I can just build off of the mental health piece, because we we spend a lot of time speaking to our consultant consultants that help us 
uh, form our benefit programs and uh, uh, ensure that we have the right things in place for our team members. Uh, mental health is one of the the num- one of the largest uh, components to uh, requirements for uh, employee health and wellness. And uh, it's always been a very difficult one because it's so nebulous and something that people don't often want to speak about. Um, but, you know, making sure that we have employee assistance programs in place and having uh, avenues for our employees to, uh, to get the help they need um, and training our, our leaders in how to properly deal with situations with, with people that are having issues with mental health, especially in the world that we're currently faced with right now. It's, it's more than just the uh, the stress of work that we bring all that baggage from home and what we're hearing in the news and media and our drive into work uh, or we're, however we're getting to work and you're listening to the news it, it, it's very distracting and mental health has uh, reached an all-time uh, epidemic um, high in terms of people needing an outlet to to deal with that So I I just wanted to mention, Tracy, because I think your question is a very good one. Uh, In terms of what people need, right, to to stay, the benefits that they're looking for, uh, I think the organizations right now that are really wrapping their arms around attrition and um, that have strategies in place to really retain their employees, they're focusing inward. So they're doing uh, employee surveys or pulse checks and they're asking, you know, how they're doing, what it is that's working well for them, where there are gaps, what they need to see. So they're getting feedback and input, but then they're taking action on that feedback and input. And I think every employee, and organization are different in that regard. So it's really important to um, look at your internal team members and ask them and, uh, and develop you know, benefits and strategies that make sense. So you both bring up an interesting point. And if we look at sort of benefits or experiences that we want uh, employees to have, looking inward, how do you uh, also develop programs for your current and future leaders to be able to, uh, you know, sort of bring these promises to life when an employee actually comes within, inside your organization? How do you prepare your current leadership to deal with the new uh, wave of talent? Yeah, that's a good question, Tracy, because uh, investing in uh, development of our leaders is a, a very important um important component to ensuring that employees are getting what they need. Um, I, I'm a very strong, a, a strong believer in, 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 in strong uh, leadership development programs. Um, interesting. I, I, I sat on a, uh, um, a, a, a session with a group of uh, like-minded colleagues probably two or three weeks ago. And I heard a, a, a very interesting comment that made me really think about our organization and something that we we could potentially focus in on. Um, but they, they started to do training for their team leaders on, um, they call it stay training. Uh, driving the accountability of uh, turnover and um, engagement and, and um, uh, you know, basically keeping people ha- happy to be wanting to come into work every day. It, it's, it's not an HR issue. Um, we can help create the programs and, and we can help get them out there. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's up to leadership to ensure that people um, are, are wanting to engage and stay. And so having stay interviews with people it, it is a really interesting idea. Um, so teaching our team members how to do that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not here as your leader, uh, you know, to create an environment um, that, uh, the, that is perfect for you every day. Um, but I am here to develop you and to make sure you're growing and you're getting the most out of your, your uh, situation while we're together. Um, a big believer in talent management and talent development. And I think that's something our team members should be open to our leaders to be saying, you know what, this isn't working for me. And this is why it's not working for me. So developing a strong, trusted relationship with our team members is very, very important. So uh, you you bring up a great point. We're continuing to invest in our leadership development programs and will continue to grow them. And I do think that's an interesting component, that whole engagement and stay. How do we keep you? 
Um, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What can we do better? It almost feels like a lot of this is is uh, dovetailing into culture shift or what might be coming in the future for us to see culture shifts within organizations in order to adapt to a new uh, you know, wave of talent and, and also to uh, basically to uphold your promises as you hire new talent and attract new talent to actually live and breathe what perhaps, um, you know, uh, culture of the past to culture of the future. So uh, to me, it feels like we're almost just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of kind of what happens next. Um, so as we get to the end of our episode, I just wanted to, you know, ask for your final thoughts on you know, in terms of an organization, um, you know, being able to remain competitive and profitable in this type of environment, um, you know, what are your parting thoughts in terms of what they can do to, you know, be competitive in the talent game, uh, you know, and tracting, uh, and it's less about retention, but really right now, obviously the key is, is to get candidates, uh, in the door and be able to engage them in conversation. So, you know, your parting thoughts on what companies can do, uh, to be at the front of the list or, you know, top of the top of the pile for the candidate, because it's almost like things have also been flipped where candidates are interviewing us more than we're interviewing them now. As an organization, we're growing and trying to find people at a, a pace that I've never seen before in the history of uh, working in human resources. So this is very top of mind to me right now. Um, I, what I think is really important, a couple things that Megan mentioned, the whole social responsibility piece is is how do we harness that and see um, where we fit, what our what our values are, and how can we um, har- um, leverage that. And uh, and what I mean by that is a couple things. One, yeah, let's let's tell people, let's let's find out what it is. And let's talk about it. Let's get it out there so that that it's understood. But also, is there an opportunity for us to leverage, leverage that? And um, uh, for example, we do um, we do give back to the community. Well, should we be looking at that differently and saying, not only do we give back to the community, but we're also going to start giving back to the community in a way that is going to um, drive. Um, uh, uh, the development of talent in our communities. So, um, you know, giving money to schools that are investing in the skilled trades um, or engineering schools or whatever it is that we're focusing our intention on. I think that that is one piece and something that that we need to take a look at and, and, and organizations need to take a look at. And the second piece is, at least from from our point of view right now, how are we going to grow our talent from within? How can we bring in fresh talent that perhaps didn't even know that they wanted to be working in the manufacturing field? Um, Introduce them to what these jobs look like and um, show them that there's a career path for them. Um, pay for talent or pay for skill is a word that we use. So as you grow, your pay increases along the way um, and, and show that future opportunity. Because I do believe that the, the current generation, they are looking to move around a lot. They are looking to, to grow. Um, but maybe we can make it a, a culture where they want to stay here a little bit longer. We, we need to consider and we need to look at uh, bringing in uh, fresh new talent that perhaps haven't um, thought about the manufacturing uh, field and show them what it's all about, show how exciting it can be, uh, show them what the career path looks like, make sure that there's a development, there's development in place, uh, make sure that we communicate the pay for skill. So the more you grow, the, the more money you can make and the more exciting that the roles can become. So, uh, yeah, so those are some things just off the top of my head that I I think um, are really important for us to do going forward. We can no longer just be looking for people that come with all the skills and can start and hit the ground running. Uh, In most of our markets, that's just impossible. They're just, it's just not um, available. So we have to think differently. Has to be a willingness to train and retain. Exactly. I think those are excellent points, Tina. Just three uh, additional thoughts from me. Uh, I I think the first thing is to prioritize experience. So wrap your arms around your current employees. Make sure they feel recognized and valued uh, and that you understand 
first and foremost, what's most important to them going forward. Um, Secondly, with new hires coming in, be swift in your hiring process. They have lots of options and opportunities out there right now. So the quicker you can move people through the process and provide them an experience that feels great, um, the better the outcome. And finally, when people have been hired into your organization. Anecdotally, we're seeing that new hire attrition is quite high in organizations right now too. So make sure that you have strong integration plans so that they can be successful uh, and and truly have long-term careers with Husky. Secondly, like Tina said, I think you need to get really creative about your hiring. Look where others aren't going, hire for potential, for um, attitude and, and upskill in those areas. Upskilling is going to be the way of the future for everyone. Um, so you'll be ahead of the game in, in that regard. Build community partnerships, get people excited about careers in manufacturing again. Um, I don't think that I truly understood how high performing and innovative the manufacturing sector is until I worked in it myself. So give people that inside view and an opportunity to uh, get a feel for a career uh, at Husky. And third, make strategic workforce planning a priority always. So it's not something you can do once a year. It's something that needs to be done regularly, um, discussed at you know meetings at every opportunity really to make sure that you have a plan uh, to replenish your talent always. Wow, what a discussion, ladies. Thanks so much uh, to both of you for contributing to what I think is one of the most important topics, uh, you know, sort of today when looking at, you know, how do manufacturing companies move forward, um, you know, especially, you know, in terms of growth uh, for the company itself, but also in terms of growth of uh, talent. So thanks for your insights and inputs, and I appreciate you joining me on today's episode. Mm-hmm. 